hosting you here uh, in Haifa. And uh, I know that for some of you, this is the very first time that you are in the Holy Land, so we hope to make it a memorable experience. And um, while this is morning for us, it is way past midnight for many of you. So we promise uh, to rise up to the challenge and keep you awake and invigorated. And as Ido said, we have a, a two day uh, long uh, program full of goodies, uh, intellectual activities, um, educational activities, recreational activities, as well as great company, uh, uh, delicious and kosher food, and believe it or not, ethnic music and dancing. And not only we will watch dancing, but also we will, we will dance ourselves, if you'd like. So, and of course, meeting leading scholars from Israel, Europe, and the US. So, there is so much to look forward to. And now, and I hope it's not a downer to my presentation. So um, it is not every day that a scholar is fortunate enough to be granted the opportunity to shed light on a severely underexplored area of legal inquiry. And um, such opportunity is afforded us in studying the trials and tribulations of Muslim women seeking maintenance in Israel's Sharia and civil courts. So please stay tuned while I go through some preliminaries and the stories go, we shall begin at the beginning. I want to tell you the story of a 20-year-old reform that was spearheaded by a coalition of women rights organizations. Uh, this femin feminist initiative sought to demonopolize the jurisdictional authority of the Sharia courts and for the first time in Israel's legal history to vest civil tribunals with concurrent authority to adjudicate uh, uh, ancillary matrimonial matters of Muslim couples. And by so doing, Muslim women were finally granted the same forum selection privilege enjoyed by their Jewish sisters for half a century. And the big deal was that now, these Jewish-dominated civil institutions were now required to apply uh, uh, Sharia law and tread into the treacherous territory of uh, uh, Islamic religious interpretation. And the impetus for the reform was uh, uh, to uh, uh, save uh, the desire, like to save women from their uh, uh, patriarchal communal uh, uh, tribunals and to allow them access to the civil courts, which are largely considered uh, uh, as liberal and as uh, 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 enlightened agents of gender equality. And uh, um, interestingly, even though you know uh, 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 the, this reform is extremely important, it seems to uh, uh, have been shunned from both the public and academic purviews after its passage. And so even though it's already celebrated its 20th anniversary, we know almost nothing about its actual implementation, about whether it's achieved its stated feminist goals, or about its potential gender repercussions on the rights and status of um, Muslim women. Uh, so uh, uh, in order to uh, address these questions, what we did was uh, to conduct a systematic inter-tribunal comparison of the rulings of the uh, uh, Sharia courts vis-a-vis -vis the civil family courts uh, on the issue of the uh, maintenance suits of Muslim women. And lo and behold, do we have a story to tell? So I'll skip methodological issues and just tell you that the reform had counterintuitive effects. Well, the Sharia courts managed to develop a, an, an, an emancipa, an, how do you say this? Em, emancipat, emancipatory and uh, gender sensitive wife maintenance jurisprudence. The civil family courts, on the other hand, adopted a patriarchal and, and traditional interpretation of the same body of Islamic law that operate systematically to the detriment of Muslim women. Let's take a quick look at Sharia court jurisprudence. Uh, um, so uh, these courts seem to have established wife maintenance as an absolute male obligation that may only be shed if a woman fails to uphold her duty of confinement. That is, resident, residence in the marital household. And the interpretive trend is clear. 
On the one hand, the Sharia courts strictly confined the reach of the duty of confinement, and on the other hand, they extremely broadened the spectrum of justifications that may exempt women from their wifely duty. So let's see examples. So for example, the court held that uh, um, this uh, a duty of confinement is based on one and only foundation, dwelling in the marital household and not leaving it without permission. And so accordingly, the courts uh, dismissed uh, uh, um, claims of many husbands that tried to convince the courts that their wives were rebellious, uh, adulterous, disobedient. And like to paraphrase Shakespeare, uh, these husbands gr went to great length to uh, argue that the wives were shrews in violations of their feminine and sexual duties and the need of taming. But to no avail. Also, the court held that if the woman left the house, but her husband does not ask her to come back, he has to pay. If she left the house and she shows even a mere willingness to come back, he has to pay. If she left the house because he does not allow her family to visit, he has to pay. If she left the house because it does not constitute a so-called legal abode, he has to pay. And the court made it ever more difficult to satisfy this husbandly responsibility. So the house has to be a, a proper, serene, and peaceful a, a residence that provides a wife with dignity, security, and privacy, and a healthy and a, a calm environment alongside reputable numbers. Uh, and neighbors, do you have such environment? You, with you at your home, so it's very difficult to satisfy. Also, if the husband is violent, he has to pay. This may sound trivial to you, but don't forget that the Sharia a, 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 a grants a husband a privilege to, to physically discipline his wife. So what did the court do? The court bypassed this uh, Sharia permit by uh, uh, constraining domestic violence as necessarily impairing her house's capacity to serve as a legal abode. Uh, and so uh, um, we see also that the recent case law uh, embodies a, 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 a sheer intolerance toward any form of violence. Uh, so the duty of confinement is voided even if uh, uh, the frequency or severity of the violence is objectively negligible, even if it is verbal or economic abuse, and if it, even if it is a mere threat rather than an, a, a concrete act of violence. And uh, uh, the Sharia court also instituted a series of innovations that allowed them to increase the level of maintenance <coughs> over and above the average rate awarded by either the civil family court or any of Israel's other tribunals. And so to cut a long story short, Sharia court jurisprudence <coughs> seems to benefit uh, women at every step of the way, beginning with the swiftness of its decisions um, through the criteria which establish eligibility for maintenance and onward to the rate and extent of maintenance. By the way, they, they do it also by, by, uh, by um, uh, holding that a woman's economic status, her assets, her for, uh, professional income are utterly irrelevant for determining the level of maintenance. Um, but when we take a look at, Shari at this, the civil family court jurisprudence, we see that the gendered uh, balance of power simply reverses itself. I, 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 I can say without exaggeration that the civil family court case law is the mirror image of Sharia court case law. For one thing, the family, the, uh, uh, the family court uh, um, uh, um, adopted an ever broader interpretation of the duty of confinement. And for another, it radically narrowed the Sharia justification for departing the marital household. Let's see examples, outrageous examples. We couldn't believe our eyes. Um, so recall that Islamic law is satisfied with a woman's mere joint residence with her husband. But nonetheless, the civil family court takes her entire behavior into account and holds her 
to a range of marital duties and expectations. The court even imposed on Muslim women the Jewish law doctrine of a rebellious wife and then supportably held that a Muslim wife forfeits her maintenance if she uh, does not give her husband sexual <coughs> access to her body. And this trend of Judaizing Islamic law to the detriment of Muslim women is ever growing. I'm freezing here. Can, can something be done about that? So recently, the court uh, um, subject, subjected uh, Muslim women to a trinity of halachic uh, Jewish law uh, uh, grounds that would cause a Jewish wife to lose her maintenance. So one is an act of adultery. The second is the so-called act of ugliness, terminology taken from Jewish law. And the third is a woman who violates uh, religious precepts, a woman who uh, is not respectful toward her husband and who goes out with other men on a non-sexual basis. So really the inscription of is, uh, Islamic maintenance law with moralistic considerations thus both Judaizes and patriarchalizes Islamic law at the same time and without any justification. Really, if this was not so sad, it would be really funny. Like in, like in one case, the court went so far as to erroneously depict a, a Muslim couple as being married according to the laws of Moses and Israel. Kedat Moshe Israel. Unbelievable. Uh, um, uh, and, um, so let's take another, oh, thank you so much, Ido. Uh, let's take another uh, example of the women unfriendly interpretation uh, of Islamic law. It relates to the circumstances when a woman shows willingness to return to the marital house. And uh, uh, while the, for the Sharia court this is more than enough, the civil court refused to view such circumstances as satisfying um, the duty of confinement. And the court, the civil court, went so far as to uh, 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 suggest that an abused woman's claim of willingness to return to the marital house is necessarily unreliable. And another example relates to uh, um, court uh, protection orders or restraining orders obtained with a uh, husbandly consent. So. Uh, while the Sharia court construed husbandly consent as a waiver of the duty of confinement, the civil court viewed such orders <clears throat> as evidence that the wife is no longer interested in obeying her husband and thus no longer entitled to his support. And as I mentioned, the court also inexplicably and, and, and radically uh, uh, limited the Sharia justification for departing the marital household. I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example for, for a case. Um, the woman uh, refused to admit her husband into the house after he married new wives, and after spending all of his money, all of their money, sorry, on, the, on his new wives. So all the, all the civil court has to say was, and I almost quote, a, a Sharia law is an archaic and patriarchal legal system, and so, and this is me now, a woman has to turn the other cheek, as it were, if she wishes to get paid. Interestingly enough, the very same case reached the Sharia court a few months later. I will not go into the procedural details of how it is possible and why, but let's just say that the Sharia court rebuked the civil court and told it that it was fundamentally wrong and that the woman was perfectly justified in kicking her husband out. <laughs> yeah. The court also took issue with the orientalist labeling of uh, Islamic law as archaic and patriarchal and advised its uh, uh, a civil counterpart to familiarize itself with classical Sharia sources that celebrate uh, women's rights. And even worse, the court, I don't know why, puzzlingly, puzzlingly, um, decided that domestic violence was the only valid justification for leaving the marital household and also held that moderate violence or physical or financial abuse were part of a husband's prerogative 
to discipline his wife under Islamic law. And so a wife is expected to tolerate such behavior if she wishes to get paid. And also, what's also very strange, in sharp contrast distinction to the case law with regard to the maintenance of Jewish wives, we see that the case law on Muslim wives exhibit a trend of an increase rather than a decrease of the evidentiary burden imposed in order to prove domestic violence. So, for example, uh, the civil family court refuses to see restraining orders or court protection ordered issues with the husband's consent as evidence of marital violence. The court also uh, uh, um, views a delay in filing a, a, a police complaint or, to, uh, or uh, it, it ascribed to it an evidentiary a negative evidentiary value, as well as to the fact that no uh, um, indictment uh, resulting in a conviction has be, had been filed. And, um, and I want to, to use some quotations. The court also says, the court also says that uh, um, a claim of domestic violence should be doubted, and I quote, since the wife, yeah, it's a quote, the wife who is both educationally and behaviorally savvy did not file a motion for a court protection order or a police complaint alleging violence, and this suffices to show that we are concerned with claims that are difficult to accept. And in another decision, the court also rejected a woman's claim to have left the marital household because of domestic violence, and why? And I quote again, since her testimony repeatedly noted her desire for matrimonial reconciliation, something which does not accord with her claims of violence and abuse. It is thus unclear how the wife expects this court to believe her. And a similar kind of reasoning uh, was employed uh, by the family court with regard to a, a woman who claimed to have suffered uh, um, physical and verbal abuse during 14 years uh, of marriage. And ironically, the very claim for a prolonged abuse acted against her. And I quote again, this court wonders and inquires how a battered and humiliated wife, who was also a rape victim, um, lived with a so-called violent and dangerous husband, yet withstood his con conduct for 40 years. This and um, we see that really this pernicious judicial trend uh, totally uh, uh, ignores the severe underreporting that typifies Muslim Palestinian women uh, uh, who are victims of domestic violence and really makes no allowances for the societal, cultural, and the economic barriers that prevent many of them from escaping abusive marriages or from approaching um, state ag agents. Um, so uh, let's conclude with the case law on uh, uh, the level uh, and amount of maintenance as, ba as passed by both tribunals because they also represent a, a mirror image of sorts. Um, while the uh, Sharia courts proceed from a, a conservative and traditional premise that leads them to benefit women, the civil family courts proceed from a liberal premise of formal equality that leads them to harm women. So for example, the court consistently held that, uh, that husbands are exempted from supporting wives who already worked for a living, but occasionally, also wives who uh, um, uh, never worked outside the home and um, after offsetting their potential uh, 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 earning capacity from their maintenance. And in one such case, case the court denied maintenance from a woman who had absolutely no employment history and who served as a housewife and sole caretaker of three children. And boy, I know how, it, how difficult it is now after I just had uh, two babies myself. Uh, and uh, I take it really personally now. Um, and uh, uh, and, and uh, uh, 
and they all had, had a long marriage of, I think, 14 years. And still, the court found it appropriate to say that, uh, um, and I quote, that the award of uh, maintenance belongs in the distant past when living conditions were different and the husband bore the lion's share of brand winning, brand winning for his family. It was the husband who was charged with the laborious duty of leaving uh, the household to work so he could support his wife and children. On the other hand, the wife was tasked with the burden of maintaining the household and was thus confined to her home and engaged in carrying out all manner of housework and child rearing. Today, life has changed. And most women have joined the labor force and earn a respectable wage. So we see that the family court uh, adopted a false premise of imagined gender parity that applies the rhetoric of equality to an avowedly unequal reality. The court also created uh, artificial analogies between Muslim uh, uh, women and Muslim men, and between Muslim women and Jewish women. Because, you know, a judicial approach that insists that most women join the labor force and then they earn respectable wage really uh, 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 is oblivious to both intergender and intragender um, differences. It is a judicial approach that is anchored in the life experience of middle class Jewish women as a point of reference and totally ignores the well known fact that Muslim women are the most discriminated population in the Israeli labor force. They uh, 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 suffer from the highest unemployment rates and from the lowest wages. Um, and so, the unavoidable conclusion is that the civilization of Islamic law contributes to the patriarchalization of the Sharia, to the feminization of poverty, and to gross gender injustice. What may account for this strange and paradoxical phenomena? I also wonder. It is partly because of uh, uh, um, judicial, mostly Jewish, ignorance. But it is also because the civil instance is encumbered by um, Orientalist imagery that uh, uh, limits the range of its uh, interpretive uh, uh, maneuverability and really empties Islamic law of its uh, ameliorative and emancipatory, emancipatory, how do you say this word? Emancipatory. Emancipatory. Uh, 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 a potential. Uh, and how do the Sharia courts respond to this development? And what can be done about it? Well, my friends, this is a story for another day. Thank you very much.